Hello everyone, today we're going to have a class on the relative value of the pieces. I know we have already spoken about the point value of the pieces. You should know by now how many points each piece is. But what we're going to be doing today, uh, I'm going to be showing you a game by one of the best players ever, Gary Kasparov. And you're going to see him playing versus another great player, Vladimir Kramnik. In this game, Kasparov was able to successfully sacrifice his queen for two of his opponent's minor pieces. And this is exactly the point of today's class. Now that you know that the knight is typically worse than the rook, and the rook is worse than the queen, and the pawn is worse than the knight and the bishop, that sometimes things could be a little bit different. Sometimes a knight could be even better than a queen. And I think this game is going to be a good example of that. And I know that this far in the course, you should already understand that because we've talked about combinations, tactics where you have to sacrifice pieces in order to get a certain objective. But ultimately, if this is something that you already know, it's not going to hurt for you to review this game. And like I said before, there's a lot to learn from such a game. But like always, we're going to start from the beginning right before we get to that game. Why do we say that the rook is better than the knight? Well, you're going to see how the rook could easily go all the way to your enemy's territory and attack multiple pieces at the same time very easily. Even if the knight comes and protects, well, the rook is going to prove to be better by attacking that knight and continue to attack these pawns. Now, if the knight moves away, we get the pawn. If they try to protect the knight, well, the rook is going to get the other pawn on, on b7. So this shows you how powerful the rook is compared to the knight. That's why the rook is five points, the knight is only three. If it was the other way around, let's say we put this knight, let's say we put it magically, which the knight shows up here. Well, he's attacking only one pawn. And all it takes for us to, to save it is to just push up, we're attacking that knight, and now the knight cannot attack any of the other pawns. He could go for the rook, but then we could not only try to trap him, I think if we go rook c1, you see, he's already trapped. There's nowhere he could go to be safe. So this shows you how the rook is better than the knight. If instead we had the bishop, the bishop is also considered less valuable than the rook. Well, here's the point. This bishop is aiming at one of my pawns right now. I could simply move my pawn up and that's it. This bishop can never attack these pawns since they are on the light square. And this is one of the biggest deficiencies for, for the bishop. The bishop can only control half of the squares on the board. My rook could attack light and dark squares. The bishop can only attack half of the squares on the board. Now let's take a look at the last position we're going to analyze before we look into that game. In this position, I'm the white pieces to move and I realize that the black pieces are ready to go knight f3 attacking the king and if the king goes to h1 they're going to put me in checkmate so this knight is so powerful in the center he's threatening to put me in checkmate with the help of the queen so in this case we can say that this knight is more powerful than my rook my rook is not doing much is in a very defensive position so i'm forced to actually trade my rook for the knight which proves how powerful that knight is so in this case we can say that the knight was relatively more valuable than the rook Okay, so here we are. This game, Kasparov had the black pieces. And like I said before, he's playing another great player, Vladimir Kramnik. And I keep repeating this because I don't want you to feel like, oh, of course he won't, even though he gave the queen up because he was playing a beginner. No, this is someone that knows what to do. He knows how to play chess. He's actually defeated Kasparov many times. But the minor pieces that Kasparov got in exchange for his queen were able to perform better to be more active than his opponent's queen. So let's get started. This game starts with a move d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7. And by the way, we've talked already about the Fianchetto idea. So this opening involved the Fianchetto, and this is called the king's Indian defense. What the black pieces are doing is called the king's Indian defense. So e4, pawn to d6, we don't want this pawn to attack the knight. Knight f3, castle, then bishop e2, pawn e5, attacking the center. Now, those of you who are not familiar with this opening, you might be wondering, okay, why would Kasparov put the pawn on e5 when he's being attacked twice and there's only one defender? Well, there's a very well-known trick here. If the white pieces took the pawn, and we take back, and then he takes on, on e5, well, you could easily just take on e4. Even though they could take knight for free, you're doing a discover attack on this knight. So you're basically getting that pawn back. So that's why... Uh, e5 is considered uh, a good move here. So after pawn e5, they just did d5, pawn a5. Now this move, guys, is you're going to see how this knight is going to end up on c5. 
and we don't want anyone to be able to kick us out. So a5 is a prophylactic move, it's anticipating what the white pieces could do. So bishop g5, h6, we don't want the bishop on, in our territory. Then knight a6. Now this knight is going to the edge, something else that might seem a little odd, but it's just temporary. We know where he wants to go. So castle, bishop d7, all of our pieces are developed, and now knight to c5. So I'm going to stop here because this is already move number 11. And as you can see, the black pieces have all of their pieces fully developed. They're putting pressure in the center. Um, again, they can, the knight cannot be kicked out of this knight's position because we anticipated that and we put the pawn on a5. So every move that we've done so far has a very good purpose. After pawn to b3, Kasparov came up with this nice move. He realized that this bishop is the hanging piece. We've talked about this in the past. And if we lifted this knight, we will be doing a discover attack on the, on the bishop. So he took on e4. This is a move that actually takes a lot of courage to do, especially if you're not familiar with the concept of initiative, of having the initiative, if you're not comfortable giving up your queen. But he calculated that after he took the pawn, if the knight took, well, he could get the, the piece right back. This is hanging. And if the bishop took, which is what Kramnik did, he could continue to take on c3 by hitting the queen. Then queen e1, notice that the queen cannot go after the knight because then we take the bishop for free with a check. So the queen is forced to go to e1, and that gives us enough time to collect the bishop. So, so far, what have we done? He gave up his queen in order to get the knight that was here and the bishop that was here that he they ended up taking the queen. At this point, if we look at the point value, guys, we're losing by two points. And not only that, we give up the most powerful piece. But you're going to see how the two minor pieces we get in return, they're going to be more useful than the white queen. And notice right now this queen is back here, very passive. And you're going to see how the game continues. So rook c1, trying to activate the rook, attacking the knight. The knight takes another pawn. So now this knight is actually continuing to collect more points. But again, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that our pieces are active and we continue to attack. If we let the white pieces get active, it's going to get even more complicated for us. So rook a1 attacking the knight, we go back to b4, bishop d1, and now look at this bishop. He's in a very nice diagonal. Remember the Fianchetto bishop? And we're ready to do a discovered attack. The only piece in between my bishop and the rook is my own pawn. So they moved it up, not only gaining more space and offering support to the knights, but I'm doing that with the tempo. They have to take care of the rook. So they move the rook. Now, rook e8. We need to bring more support and activate that rook. Queen e3, f5. So all of our pieces are working together trying to attack. h4, rook f8. So we're trying to do pawn f4. If we get to f4, we're going to be able to finally get to make contact with the king's defenses and open up the king. So g3, you see, he's, he's anticipating our plan and he's not letting us do pawn to f4. If you look at this position, guys, this is already move number 21. Their queen is a little bit more active, but all of their pieces are not coordinated. So the rooks are not connected, this bishop is passive, so is the knight. And not only that, it's hard for them to get active. This bishop cannot go here because of the knight, here because of the pawn, here or here because of the other pawns. The knight has no squares to go to. He could go here, he gets taken. If he takes on e4, he gets taken. So the white pieces are having a hard time to get coordinated. And this is the factor that is going to allow the black pieces to win the game. If you look at the black pieces, all of them are active except for this rook. This is the only piece that hasn't moved. And that's what he did next. Rook e8, then king g2, knight finally goes to d3. You see, this one is offering support as well as the other knight. Rook g1. Now, finally, we have enough pieces to push on f4. And with this move, we're finally getting closer to the king. So they took. Then we took with the rook. Our rook is coming in. We're putting now pressure on f2. So all of our pieces are working together. Eventually, I could even bring the other rook to add more pressure. So h5. And instead of taking, we go pawn to g5. Rook f1. He knows that f2 is hanging. So rook h4. Now we could even do this skewer. The rook comes over and now guys this is a good time to take a moment because it is important that you understand that when you are attacking 
and especially if you're down material. Not that that's the case here, but in general, when you're attacking, you don't want to simplify pieces. If I'm the one defending, like the white pieces are, they want to simplify the game. The less pieces my opponent has to attack me, the better. But in this case, with the black pieces, we're attacking the king. We want to keep our pieces on the board. If this rook is traded, they're going to feel so much better because we don't have many other pieces to attack at the moment. That's why the black pieces just move to f4. We keep putting pressure on f2. He's coming back. And now we're just going to bring another piece to help. And we talked about this before. So now we have one, two, three pieces attacking f2. So they ended up pushing the pawn up. Now the knight cannot take. But guess what? Now the rook came back to h4, trying to make this idea work again. So they took on e4. At this point, I think... Uh, even though I told you it's not a good idea to trade pieces, I think this leads to a nice combination if I take on if you take on f1. Uh, because again, we have now way more pieces active to attack the king. But in this game, they actually went with knight f4 check. King goes to g1. Knight c to d3. So look at this. This knight is coming closer to the king and making this square available for the other knight to jump in. So knight c to d3. This rook is out of the game. These two are not helping much. And we have like five pieces and even the bishop could come in handy at some point so e5 trying to create something but now our knight is coming to take it getting closer to the king rook c1 rook h3 putting pressure on the queen getting ready to get to g3 and attack before we couldn't go to g4 to attack the king but we're winning a tempo by hitting the queen making the queen go away and now we're looking for a safer square to attack the king so knight f3 blocking the attack but getting pinned at the same time so g4, there's a pin piece. We want to put pressure on that pawn. So g4, knight takes knight. We get the queen back. So you see, there was so much pressure on the white pieces that they had to give the queen back. So rook takes on e3, they take on d7. And now look at this position. After they give the queen back, we have two rooks, two rooks, bishop, bishop, knight, knight. But then they have four pawns, we have six pawns, not to mention that this king is in trouble. So knight is three check, they had to stay close to protect the rook. And after this trade, g3. Now the pawn, two squares away from promotion, king to g2 to protect. But now after knight f4 check, this pawn is going to make it all the way down. Here the white pieces resigned, they understood that there was not much to do. But just to show you guys, if the king had gone to g1, well, we have checkmate in one move. The knight is not letting the king go up, and the pawn is controlling these other two. If the king had gone to f1, then we have check. The king could go to g1 on f2. If he goes to g1, well, check, followed by the queen. If the king goes to f2, we have so many ways to continue here. The first one that comes to my mind is rook e1 anyways to help the queen. If he takes, well, he's going away, we can promote easily. Uh, but you have many other moves. I think you could even do bishop d4, getting ready for a discovered. You could just move the rook, maybe rook h3. So there's not much they could do. But the point is that at this point, the game was over. And notice how this rook wasn't able to do much. The bishop wasn't able to do much. And in my opinion, this is a perfect example to show you how sometimes pieces could be more valuable than the points that we assigned them. This is a game that we're going to revisit in the future because there's so much more to learn from it, but I really went fast because I wanted to focus only on the concept of the relative value of the pieces. So with that said, I'm going to leave it here. Feel free to go over it again, review, make sure that you didn't miss anything. Next class, we're going to talk about a very interesting tactic that you have to know. So stay tuned, leave me any questions you might have in the comment section, and I'll talk to you next time.